Hey guys, another episode of 10 Questions. Today, media superstar and one of my best friends, Nate Burleson of CBS and just about every other network. We talked to him about pregame shows in the NFL. Why are they still good? Why do they never change? What does he love about the NFL right now? What bothers him about it? How do you raise kids when you're famous and have money? And what the hell happened on the Minnesota Vikings love boat story way back in the day? That, a lot of TV, a lot of fun, a lot of media, a lot of sports, a lot of everything. Nate Burleson, here he comes. This podcast is scheduled for 10 questions. Fighting out of New York, standing at 5 feet 11 inches tall, and wearing the red, white, and blue trunks, presenting Kyle Brandt. Yeah, Bruce, my man, as always, with the intro, welcome to another episode of 10 Questions. You got a podcast, I got a podcast, everybody got a podcast. Not like this one, not like this one. You don't come here to have a little conversation, you come here to compete. This is the arena, this is the Coliseum. Everybody leaves with a score, everybody gets 10 questions, they're each worth one point. They get it right, they get a point. If they get it wrong, they get bubkiss. You can get a zero, you can get a 10. We've never had either. Will today be the day? Before we bring in today's contestant, let's give him just a little taste of who some of the people are that he's up against. Some of the prior scores Roll it. Here is a little good morning football slash 10 questions slash CBS roll call. Here's who he's going against. I'm Michael Strahan, and I got an eight out of 10. I'm Aaron Rodgers, and I got six out of 10. Hey, I'm Aaron Andrews. I got a five out of 10. Yo, 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 McConaughey here. I just got my seven out of 10. All right, let's get him in here. You know, this guy does really good intros, so I got to stick the landing on this. I have to give you the most pertinent information about this guy. Here we go. He loves the television show DuckTales. When he flies, he sleeps with a blanket fully over his head. I'm talking like a children's Halloween costume over his head. He is one of my favorite people in the world and an old, old friend in the 10 questions. It is Nathaniel Eugene Burleson. What's up, baby? What's going on? I finally made it. Now listen, it, it took me some time. I mean, it, it, took me, it took me five years. It took me a few Emmys. It took me um, uh, landing a, a spot next to Gail King to finally get on 10 questions. I can call my mama tonight and say, mama, I made it. What's up, KB? It's great to see you. It's great to talk to you. Nate, I got this thing where we've done dozens of episodes. And a lot of times, you know, movie stars or superstars who come on, and I've never met them before. I don't know them. The Zoom window opens up. And I'm kind of nervous about how they're going to do. And I'm like, man, I hope they do well. I hope they get a good score. With yeah. you, I don't care how you do, dude. You just be you. I'm not nervous at all. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I, I kind of want to get a zero, but I'm okay. going to try because I'm competitive. Uh, but, you know, I, I've, I've been checking out the show. Yeah. I'm a fan of the show. It's creative. You know, it's that blend between trivia, all-encompassing, pop culture, mm -hmm. movies, music, sports. And, of course, you weave in the interview. So um, this is a great show, and I'm glad to be on, fam. Thank you, buddy. We will start it now. I got our 10 questions right here, and there it's a good batch. Nate, before right, we go, listen, you know, I've seen this show, so I know how number one is. All right. So don't be trying to come out right out the gates with an intense question. <laughs> all right. Uh, it's funny you bring that up because the first episode we ever did it was with Aaron Rodgers, and he got stumped on question one and had to burn his lifeline on the first question. That lifeline, <laughs> Nate, on our show, we call it Ask a Millennial. If yeah. you get stumped, we have a real live millennial. His name's Richie, waiting, and he's like, he's here. Wings, waiting yeah. in the wings right we'll now. Call him I in. know, baby, I know. <laughs> Without further ado, Nate Burleson's 10 questions starts right now with question number one. Nate, your first topic is network television. Your first question, what does CBS stand for? Um, this is, a, this is a, an easy question. Um, <sighs> you work for CBS? I work for CBS. I've been working for CBS for four years now. Um, okay. CBS. What does it stand for? S. We have a broadcast system. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's been some rumors about the CBN change over the years. 
um, but it hasn't. So I'm gonna go with the uh, into the broadcast system. He says central broadcast system. Does he start one for one? Is he right? No, no, Nate. See, this, it's, the CBS stands for Columbia Broadcasting System. It's Columbia Broadcasting System, Nate. All right, you're 0 for 1. I don't think the millennia would have helped, um, but here's why I ask about CBS. Nate, jobs, jobs, jobs. Nobody's got more jobs. We love that. Can you tell the people over the last calendar year, what are all the jobs that you've had, all the paying jobs over the last year? Good morning, football. Um, NFL Today on Sundays. I was the voice for DraftKings for quite some time. I also was the host of an uh, uninterrupted 17 weeks podcast. Go on. Extra. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call a paying job uh, coaching high school. Um, they offered to pay. I didn't, didn't want to take the money. Um, so I would say on any given week, I was juggling five to six jobs. Five to six in a week, including jobs that refused to be paid for. And a reminder, everybody, this is a former professional football player. This is not a guy who went to broadcasting school or anything. He made his own way. So, Nate, the question always comes up with you, and I get it sometimes when I conduct interviews or I get interviewed, what can't Nate do? Um, what is the job, Nate, that you don't have that you want to have someday? That's a very good question. Um, you know, my mom wants me to be an actor. I used to um, I used to model, and I, I did some acting when I was younger. Yeah. And then one day I woke up and I could run and jump. And I was like, you know what? Let me go ahead and and see how far sports can take me. And really, I didn't have a plan to play in the NFL. I just wanted to get my education. NFL kind of happened later in my collegiate career. But as far as the job that I want, <clears throat> This is like a, a little bit of a glamour and a, and a self letness job. I would love to travel around the world and um, experience unique food and cultures. So, you know, Anthony Bourdain, World's Strangest Foods, um, you know, and, and I, and I want to go to some really gritty places. Actually, I know, and I, will, I know we'll get to this when talking about CBS Mornings. One of the things we talked about when we had our pitch meeting was all of the things that I'm interested in. But I said, look, I don't want the glamour assignments. Um, I want you to send me into the thick of it. So hopefully I get to experience a little bit of that while I'm on assignment doing features, pieces, and essays for CBS Mornings. And you're saying it, and I know you as well as I do, and I'm like, oh yeah, of course, Nate would destroy that. I would watch it. We would DVR it. It would be incredible. But let me flip the tables on you, Nate. Uh -huh. What is the one job, never mind media, pick anything you want. In, in any walk of life that you're saying, they come to you and they're like, Nate, you're hired. We want you. And you're like, Hell no, I would never do that job. I could never do that job. What is the, the job you'd never do? NFL coaching. <laughs> All right, and, come on. And, and, and I, I, I hate to take a, a, a like this left turn because people assume if you play football, then you just naturally want to coach in the NFL. I remember having a meeting with Todd Downing, uh, who was now the offensive coordinator for the Tennessee Titans. And I went up to his office I'm sitting there talking with him. I'm like, hey, are you still moving into your home? He's like, why do you ask? I'm like, oh, because you have a couple of boxes here. And he's like, no. And I'm like, well, why do you have a box here? He's like, oh. And he pulls it out, and it's a pillow and a blanket. He says, you know, when we leave here around midnight or 1 a.m., I just stay here because I have to be back at 4 or 5. And I'm thinking to myself, there is no way, no way that I would ever go back into coaching because it's so demanding. Now, if I was single, and I had, um, you know, goals of winning a Super Bowl. I would love to go back into coaching, but mm -hmm. I just can't do it because it is so demanding and it's volatile. Like they love you one day, but if your offense sucks or your team isn't good or just, you know, you just have one of those years, people are calling for your head. So um, I can't go into coaching um, as far as like a, a job that's a little bit obscure. Um, I would say uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of weird, but. Um, working in the circus. Um, <laughs> what job in the circus? <laughs> <laughs> Dealing with the animals. Okay. Like I remember going as a kid and thinking to myself, man, this is incredible. You got people on the, on the flying trapezius yeah. and the, you have these, these uh, lion tamers and people can shout out of cannons. Yeah. 
And then you see when animals attack and these elephants going rogue or a lion just ripping somebody's face off or a tiger going crazy. Uh, <laughs> I just they thought, hard. Myself, like, I would never, ever, I don't care how much you pay me, I'm straight. I don't, I don't think that we should coexist with animals outside of their animal kingdom. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you, get, yeah. if you get punched in the face by a gorilla, because you're hanging out with them at the zoo. Most likely That's on you. Really mad. That's on you, fam. That's on you. <laughs> you know, Siegfried and Roy, I got, I got 50 years of these beautiful tigers. And then one night, that thing I'm said, not... enough of this shit. <laughs> I'm, I'm over <laughs> with this. That's enough. I can't take this anymore. Oh, my God. All right. So coaching and circus, he would not do. Maybe someday, Nate, you can be uh, the coach of the Jets. Then you get coaching and a circus. But let's move on oh. to number two. <laughs> All, right. All right. So Nate did not get the first one. But Nate, the good news is uh, question number two is something you love, and it's multiple All right. choice. All right. uh, category number two is pop music. Nate, two choices. You were drafted into the NFL in April of 2003. What was the number one song in America when you were drafted? Is it A... In the Club by 50 Cent, or C, The Way You Move by Outkast? A, a or B, two of them. Just A, oh, In the a Club, or, or The Way You Move. A or B. Okay, you said A or C. Got I know, I, I, I got shook. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right, so 50 Cent, all right. Okay, it was lit. I remember coming out of 03. Remember dun, when dun, I take out. Dun, dun. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, um, you said it, you said it. Outcast is what it, was the other one? Yeah, the way you move by Outcast or like in the club the by Fifty Cent. It was I like the way you move. Nate says the way you move was the number one song when you were drafted. Yeah. You're moving to zero for two, dude. It was in the club. It was in the club. <laughs> do you want to know what just happened? Let me take you behind the scenes. I can do this with you. So I, I like to build up the confidence early. So I actually had three, which is why I said A and C, because I eliminated the middle one. I put it down to two answers to make it easier on your ass, and you still got it wrong. Still got it wrong. Still All got right. it wrong. Crazy. Here's why I'm asking you about, um, you were drafted in 2003 out of Nevada. You go to the Vikings, have this 11-year career. Now you talk about the NFL all the time. You do it at CBS, the NFL Today. 2003 to now, lots changed. Nate, what do you love right now about the state of the NFL? As a wide receiver, selfishly, I love the fact that offensive players are protected more now than ever. So there's um, there's this uh, duality that I live in when I appreciate the game from a distance. One part of me says, all right, if I was a wide receiver playing right now, I would be more dominant than I've ever been because they can't touch me at the line of scrimmage. Even when they're throwing me the ball, you can't hit me before I touch it. So most likely I'm going to be running the most confident slap route, go route, hits route, double moves, because you can't really hit me till I touch the rock. Uh, but then on the flip side, the old school player in me thinks, yeah, but it's 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 not as tough as it used to be. I remember, you know, getting, you know, my face mask grabbed at the line of scrimmage and then fighting with the DB, running across the middle and the Ray Lewis hitting me with a forearm shiver and I'm flying in the air and then getting up, fixing my face mask, dusting myself off and then catching a ball after my quarterback has scrambled. So I look at the game from two perspectives. Um, the best part about what the game gives us is that it is so exciting. There's parts of it when you're watching it that seems like an NBA All-Star game, the first half, where it's like, man, this is easy. They're just throwing this ball around. This is like seven on seven. But then, like, occasionally you want that nasty hit, and, and you want that guy to get blasted on the sideline. You want some snot bubbles and mouth fleece fine and some chip paint on somebody's helmet. Um, and then you see the flag thrown. And you're like, ah, oh, come on. So... Um, the best part about where the game is, is that it is more exciting. I don't care what you want to say. You remember there was a pocket of time where it was almost like soccer scores, you know, it was low scoring affairs, you know, three yards in a cloud of dust. And you'd be spending three hours watching a game and the score will be 10 to seven. Now you get these like 45, 42, 50 point games, you know, for what it's worth, it's exciting. So I, I feel like the evolution of the game because how much they protect the offense, it is a high flying affair. It's so fun. It's so the the talent is so high. And like you and I grew up watching football in the nineties, and like it would blow people's minds that like, wow, Steve Young can run a little bit. He is a good athlete. And now it's yeah. like every quarterback runs. And now every you got Lamar. Like you got every, it's not just Lamar. The obvious ones. 
Josh Allen runs, yeah. Mahomes runs. It's yeah. just the talent is so high. But you answered the next question, which is like, okay, so what annoys you about the current state of the NFL? It, it, the hitting is tough because I, everybody bitches and complains about you can't hit the quarterback. You know what's worse than that, though, is you turn on Monday Night Football and it's backup quarterback versus backup quarterback because everybody's hurt. So I, I, I'm fine with it, man. I've made peace with it. Have you? A little bit, yeah. And, and I, I feel like regardless of how much people may complain, or even I may complain, um, the fact that guys are healthier. Um, but there is this element of guys still having these I know, these injuries. And you're like, man, what is it? You know, I talk to Phil Sims every Sunday, and this topic comes up often. And he, he says, it's it's that field grass. It's that new, cool field grass. Oh, really? With, with the rubber pellets, he feel like it has too much grab and guys are too fast, too strong. So their ankles, they load up and their knees, they load up. The hip joints, they load up. And then as they get hit and try to move and be explosive, you have these soft tissue injuries. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I don't like that. And here's another thing I, I don't like about the game. Um, I feel like, forget about guys getting paid. You know me, I'm, I'm like Dion, pay the man, yeah, right? I want man. everybody to make money. I do feel like guys come in and they're feeling themselves more now than ever. Now, there's a large majority of players that leave college and they have a respect for the game. I'm not even talking about I me. Mean, I'm talking about the legends, you know, guys with the gold jackets and the Super Bowl yeah. ring, true legacy players. Uh, but then you have individuals that come in with a million followers and nowadays a million dollars, and it's already like they made it. Mm -hmm. Like, we're a little bit different in the NFL. This isn't the NBA you know, where a young rookie could come in. It's like we're, we're giving you the keys to the to the car, regardless of how good you are. This isn't like baseball, where a guy can come out of high school and you automatically know that dude's going to make $300 million. doesn't matter if he can hit or not or field or not. But in football, it's, there's this, there's this like unwritten rule that you appreciate what has come before you. You know, it's kind of like music. When an artist doesn't recognize all of the people that he may be copying in his own music, because they are unfamiliar with the history of that genre. It's the same thing in the NFL. So, and I, and I feel like it's only going to get worse. A, a guy leaves college and he has more followers than your mid-level player on your professional team. And now he's a millionaire before he gets his first NFL. What are you going to tell that dude? Nothing. You know what I'm saying? So Nothing. hopefully, you know, we have more guys enter the league with humility um, because this could spin out of control sooner than later. And there's no hazing. I'm not saying guys should get hazed, but, there's no like way of putting a player in check anymore. I know that you, you can't take that guy with a million bucks, have him carry your pads, uh, duct tape him to the goal line, shave his head and dump him in the cold tub. Right, right. And you used to do all of them. Nate, the, the, one of the guys who just became a finalist for the uh, hall of fame is Steve Smith senior. And I bring it up because Steve Smith senior was on this show and he got the lowest score we've ever had. He got a three out of 10 okay. and it was, it was a disaster. We go to question three. We got to get uh, on the board here, baby. We got to let's, let's just get a six little six yard catch on the flat, get you right. going. We don't need anything deep. A little screenplay, a little screenplay. Just get the ball in my hands, coach. Let's set up the screen. And guess what, Nate? Here's okay. your screen. Question three, your category is liquor. Liquor. All liquor. Right. Here we go. Question three, Nate is 0 for two. What? Cinnamon whiskey brand, popular amongst American college students. Fireball. Was that, what was that that you said, Nate? Fireball. He said Fireball. Was it actually created in Canada? Ring him up. Nate's on the board. Thank God. All right. Oh, oh my gosh. It, the That's second you're in cinnamon whiskey. Now everybody, now everybody's like, uh, damn, he got that fast. Nate is an alcoholic. <laughs> Nate does like to drink responsibly. He's a grown man. One time we were out drinking with Nate and I was taking, I was like, want to take a selfie of me and Nate. And I'm like, oh, don't worry, Nate. Like I won't post it on social media. And you're like, I don't give a damn if you do. I'm an adult. Post it. I'm That's like, a fact. I'm a grown man. <laughs> I get it though. I, I, you know, people would tell me you're working for a network now. Yeah. Even when I was in the league and they would hide their drink behind their sure. back. I'm like, bro, we're adults at an adult function. It's all good. I know it is, but I'm not asking. I'm not asking about Fireball. Just talk about drinking, even though we love to. Um, fireball is what the college kids do to pregame. They pregame with their Fireball. Nate, you're on a pregame show. You have been for years. The NFL Today. It's a funny thing with media now that there's so many new kinds of media, and media has changed so much. And yet, these network pregame shows. I've stayed almost entirely unchanged for the last 30, 40 years of our lives. It's they just are what they are mostly and they stay. 
People give those shows a lot of crap sometimes, as successful as they are. What is something about going into the making of a show like the NFL today that maybe they would be surprised to hear? If you like NBA on TNT, mm -hmm. you would most likely like our show. Um, okay. The reason I say that is because you see Shaq and Chuck go at it, and they just bicker all day long. That is the mm -hmm. same exact thing that Phil and Boom do. And not just on the show. If you think that little back and forth they have on the show is fun, just be a fly on the wall during the commercial break. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> one thing. So there is this like atmosphere of a true locker room. Even though we're all from different eras, like we sit there and, and rib each other like we've been playing together. Um, that's one thing I think people don't really understand. Two, uh, even though it, it goes by fast because we're setting up games, the games that are on our network, um, and we're trying to highlight specific players, there's a lot of work that gets put in, but our producers are like, look, have some fun. Like, I, I know we got to get to commercial breaks and I know I'm always in your ear, but let's have some fun. So when you sit back and you're watching these pregame shows, we may be straight laced and buttoned up with the tie on. But if you just crack your beer open and take a sip, you'll realize that we're just four grown men who love the sport, are very passionate and have a little goofball in us. And I feel like that is the perfect recipe for a show. And on top of that, like, this is CBS, the Tiffany Network. A couple of years ago, they were like, hey, Nate, uh, so you want to do a rap recap to kick off the year? <laughs> I was like, what? I'm like, I get it if I'm doing it on Good Morning Football or even the NFL. Right, right, right. They're like, nah, write some. And, I'm, and then they were like, we're going to have the guys behind you. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, these are my JB and, and Boom and Phil and Coach? They're like, yeah. I'm like, all right, well, they better put some icy out on or something because <laughs> they're going to be my background desk. <laughs> I want to fight them. Bust a hip or something. Uh, but, but so, yeah, you can tell that there's been this, um, this, this kind of like new approach to the same story. And I think for so many years, like you're saying, guys are like, I, we've seen this before. I get it. Yeah, it's, I it's new storylines, but it's the same NFL. For us, we're, we're trying different ways to present the package. And it works. And listen, for me, I, I, you guys look great. It, it, the show is, it looks like a million bucks. The second you hear that, dun, 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 I'm like, oh, it's Sunday. I'm in. Yeah. And JB, like, I'm all over it. Nate, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it 100% real with you. I reached out before this to a media critic who I'm not going to name, but you know him okay. and I know him. And I say, I know you always get annoyed by pregame shows. What is it about them? And he said two things. One of them is, is pretty legitimate. One of them superficial. The first one is he's like, I feel like I'm watching it and they're in the pocket for the leagues. Like, I can't tune in this Sunday and one of them is going to go on a rant about the taunting rule and how stupid it is. And I, I want to hear that. I want that authenticity. It's I feel like I'm just hearing what the league wants them to say. How do you respond? I'll respond by um, referencing last week's show. Aaron Rodgers comes up mm -hmm. and immediately I, I'm very honest. And I, I said, was. the reason why he struggled is because he wasn't there. Um, no, we're not going to, we're going to sit here and skate around it. Am I going to be the only one to sit here and tell you that, um, I could have predicted this. It's not easy just to line up and start week one. If you haven't been there all summer. And I went on my whole, Oh, I love Aaron Rodgers, and Aaron Rodgers knows this is coming from an authentic place. And then a couple of segments later, and you were watching this weekend, yeah, Boomer kind of mentioned the refs and how there were some funny calls. And I said, let's call it what it is. They were horrible this weekend. So for me, I get it. I'm part of the machine. I'm not going to sit there and try to dog any aspect of the NFL, but I would be inauthentic if I didn't speak from the heart. And the reason I am that is because we occasionally did that. Of course we work for the NFL. They, they pay us. But what we've done on Good Morning Football has given me the confidence that occasionally you're going to have to step outside of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. make people uncomfortable, and it might be your crew and cast and even your execs, and talk from the heart. because. In that moment, everybody might be lightweight shocked, but more importantly, the people that are watching, they're like, this is why I tune in. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, would, I would say that's why our show is a little bit different. It is different. And I saw the segment and I loved it. Uh, when you do that and say the refs are horrible, you get any brushback? No, um, because I, 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 I quickly reference one specific play or one specific or even a game where I'm like, you know what? These refs are horrible. I mean, they've been good all week, mm -hmm. um, and I don't see this often, but I, I just can't stand behind what, what happened this weekend or what happened in this game. So, um, and, and I think fans appreciate that. The viewer appreciates that, to occasionally hear something that is really brutally honest. 
Yeah, and I get asked that all the time working for the NFL. You get the, they're like, is there any, they tell you not to talk about things. You ever get in trouble? And I was like, I can't think of a single time in five years that I've gotten in trouble for something I've said. And Nate and I have said some crazy stuff. Crazy and I, <laughs> Like crazy in the sense of being critical, in the sense of being off color, in the sense of just being straight potty humor. Right. I never get it. And people and think they, that the NFL know, must, but they don't. There was a moment where we kind of looked at each other and we, we like, I think, simultaneously said it without saying it, they hired us for a reason. No, no. So if we're not the individuals that they hired, then we will be qu quickly replaced. And that's when our personalities came out right on camera. I know. Nate, you're one for three, all you right. have one point. All, all right, right. you got the I'll liquor go one. On. Here we go, this we get into the multimedia here, you're gonna love this. Question number four is name the movie. All I'm gonna do, Nate, is I'm gonna play a short clip from a major motion picture. Um, if you think it's some dumbass movie from the 80s or 90s, you're probably right. And so uh, here we go. Nate, listen to this clip, and all you have to do is give me the name of the movie. Money now and a lot more when I get in that office. You can take that to the bank. I'm going to take you to the bank, Senator Trent. To the blood bank. What do you think, buddy? Recognize any of the voices or the actor or anything? You know what? I might have to use a lifeline on this one. You're gonna ask the millennial if he knows this movie? <laughs> he says, I'm gonna take you to the bank, Senator Trent. And then he pauses and he goes, to the blood bank. The blood bank. Do you recognize that actor's voice who says that? I know he's kind of whispery and it's hard. It was kind of whispery, it was kind of. <laughs> you wanna ask the millennial? No, 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 because I feel like the millennials are going to get this wrong and I don't want to waste it. You know what I'm saying? But you don't want to also go into half with the timeouts or anything. You know, like if, if you feel it, use it. It's your call, buddy. Um, your call. All right, let, let's let's go with the let's, you, let's go, let's go with the millennial. Bring him in. Bring him in. Richie Bozek, a young man. There he is. Richie, say hello to Nate Burleson. Nate, how's it going? It's so great to meet you. Nice to meet you too, fam. Don't let me down, bro. <laughs> All right, Richie, you guys have 30 seconds. Richie's pretty well versed in movies and stuff. I don't know if there's one before his time, but 30 seconds on the clock. Richie and Nate Burleson, what was that movie go? All right, Richie, so let me ask you this. Do you recognize the voice? Was that Bruce Willis in there? Um, I don't know, but he said Senator, right? He said Senator something? Yeah, mm -hmm. Senator Trent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I, I mean, straight up, I don't, I don't know this. <laughs> um, hey, well, all right. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, so, I mean, is that like, is that like the name of the movie Blood Bank? It sounds like it'd be the name of a. There's no movie, movie named Blood Bank. I, I have a movie <laughs> called Blood Bank. Kyle, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a. Uh, I'll say, I'll say hard to kill, Richie. I, 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 this better be right, or else I'm gonna fight you, bro. What I see, because right. hopefully, what do you say for your answer. Hard to kill. All right, Richie, hold on. He says hard to kill. Is it hard to kill? It's hard to kill! <laughs> How did you do that? Hey, Richie, because first I was thinking about individuals with like uh, deep voices and uh, Bruce Willis came to mind, Steven Seagal came to mind. Hello. So, but Richie, what's up fam? Like, I mean, I... We, we got it right. I, somehow there was help in there. No, no, I no, no. Say. We did not get it right. I got it right. But you know what? Hey, right, Richie, yeah. I, I, it, coaches always say, know your personnel. I put you in a bad position, so I, I'll take the blame for that. I should have I, I should have went down process of elimination, deep voices. When Steven Sakal popped in my head, that's when it hit. So, all right, so. You Richie, got it right. That's all that matters. All right, Richie, you go, you go watch. Uh, Hard to Kill, Mark for Death, Out for Justice, On Deadly Ground. Just go watch the whole Steven Seagal filmography. Thank you very much. Another disappointed contestant in Richie Bozek. Nate, I have to take a sharp left turn here. I'm asking you about Hard to Kill, not because of Seagal, but because of the concept of hard news. Yeah. Um, when you were leaving Good Morning Football, we have fun, we talk sports, and in, when you were leaving, you and I talked about this. I was like, damn, Nate, like, you're going from talking about, you know, Dak Prescott outside the pocket to like Afghanistan and withdrawal, like all of that. Yeah. And I almost was nervous vicariously. Yeah. What's it like making that jump, man? You know, it, it's funny because I wasn't as nervous as I thought I was going to be. 
Um, you know, what we've done on Good Morning Football is we've created great habits for any other job that we will ever have. And I didn't realize that until I started working in other spaces, started working with extra and, and doing more work on NFL Today um, and then doing podcasts and hosting podcasts and hosting documentaries. The reason I bring all this up is because the preparation it takes to do a live three hour show, you can take that concept of how you prepare and apply it to anything. Now, that's one thing. Um, another thing is at 40 years old, when I come home and I think we're very similar in this way, mm-hmm. I don't come home and talk about football. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't come home and, I, and it's like, hey, what's up, honey? Hey, so listen, uh, uh, Peyton Manning, you know, he's going to do uh, Monday night football. <laughs> you know what? Andrew Luck might come out of retirement. Like, I don't do that. For me, I come home and I'm talking to the wife. I'm like, you see what was going on in Afghanistan? Like, man, do we have any relatives in Louisiana we have to check on? Um, you know, have you heard what's going on with with Governor Cuomo or even like, you know, hard hitting topics that are on a local level, global level? Like these are the conversations that I have. And then not to mention my I wouldn't call it expertise, but my experience in the restaurant business, owning a restaurant, um, being heavily involved in not just my own investments, investments, but helping athletes invest their own money, starting businesses. So as I started working the first few days, I realized these topics that I'm talking about on a daily basis are everything that I've either done or am doing right now, which is so comfortable. When I first left the game, I was so attached to football, right? It was like one of my first loves and it was, it was a 24 seven job. And really that's all I cared about. A lot of it was because I missed the game and I didn't want to let it go. So it was easy to get caught up in just thinking about football. But then as I hit 40, I realized, man, there's so much more to what's going on. And you've watched me over the last couple of years. I've made an effort to do less surface work at the NFL Network. You know, I've taken on bigger assignments that are impactful about, you know, the social climate of this country and, and making sure, you know, forgotten heroes from the African-American culture aren't forgotten that, you know, gave to this game. So it it, it, it all is a... It's, a, it's almost like a perfect storm of where I am and the opportunity that came. So I wasn't as nervous as I thought I would be, that's for sure. Do you remember that the first, like, very hard news type topic that you spoke about or delivered on the air? Oh, right out the gate. It, it was, I don't want to call it one hell of a week, but um, it was a week that wasn't light on any news. My first story was Afghanistan. and some of the negative feedback that Biden was getting from pulling the troops out and how the Afghan allies were speaking out. Later on in the show, um, I'm also talking about Hurricane Ida and the deaths. And then a couple of days later, I'm talking about Hurricane Ida making its way to New York and New Jersey. And these aren't, hey, we got a hurricane coming, watch out, make sure you board up your windows. These are, there's been another reported death um, and Hurricane Ida isn't going to let up um, here in the Northeast. You know, let's hope that we are prepared. And then at the end of the week, it's the 20th anniversary of 9 11. Mm. So, one thing I can say, and I appreciate about the team, CBS Mornings, um, and everybody involved, and I'm thankful for this, they didn't have me start off by saying, Hey, what's up, man? I'm Naden. We're over here in Times Square, man. Check out the studio. Happy to be here. I'm going to talk some football and we're going to eat some food. That wasn't it. They they were like, you know what? We hired him for a reason. Um, We know how intelligent he is. Let's give him the same assignments we're giving everybody else. And I appreciated that because I know as a viewer that's looking at this football, uh, football player, quote unquote, some people say Michael Strahan clone. um, If he's coming in talking about topics that aren't as impactful, then why is he even here? Um, and I don't want to be the token hire just because it, 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 it helps, it helps, you know, make our show a little bit more youthful, um, by my, my presence. So that was, that week one was one, one, um, it was a good start. Nate, you, you said it, so I'll follow. We used to laugh all the time about an old basketball player named Harold Miner. And Harold Miner just came in the league, and he was called Baby Jordan. And the second they called him Baby Jordan, it was a wrap. He was never yeah. going to be anything. We see guys, uh, tight ends come in the league. Oh, he's Baby Gronk. He's Baby this. 
How do you feel at every turn when you hear the name Michael Strahan? I appreciate the comparison. <laughs> I'm not going to run from it. I mean, Michael Strahan is a Hall of Famer, Super Bowl champion. He has done great things after he got done playing football. Um, and he's bringing in some pretty good coin doing what he does. So right out the gate, who am I to scoff at that comparison? Uh, but at the same time, just like an athlete, we may appreciate a comparison to a player from yesteryear, but I'm going to work every day to prove how different I am. And even Michael Strahan would tell you, he reached out when I first got the job. He's like, hey, Nate, congratulations. Just want to uh, reach out to you and give me a call because there are going to be some things in this new space that are going to be unfamiliar to you. So I want to give you a lay of the land, which I was thankful for him reaching out in that sense. But even Mike will tell you, we are very different um, in the way that uh, we present ourselves, our delivery, um, even, you know, the things that we are interested in off camera. So uh, I'll, I'll take that comparison, sure. but I'm, I, I'm, I'm bold enough to say, tune in and I'll show you how different I am. Mm. Well, you are very different from Strahan in one sense. Strahan got an eight out of 10 on the show, my friend, and you're a two out of four as we go to question five. Well, Let's pick up the pace. You started off by saying the space between the outfielders, the debates, the bop up with the people, and you gave him a hit. Like, man, come on. Oh, you watched the Strahan one, all right. The gap. I See, that's the thing. I don't know, Stray. I know you. I don't care how you do, Nate. I got nothing to prove. Number five. All right, number five. Uh, your category right. is sitcoms. Sitcoms. The late Philip Seymour Hoffman turned down what iconic sitcom role? Ooh, this is tough. Yeah. Um, it had to be, you know, very young Philip, right? Um, this is before his career really took off. So I'm thinking, what well, was this, maybe early 90s? Uh, iconic. You're saying iconic. So this is huge. Yeah, this is an iconic I, role. Am I going 80s? Um, you know what? I'll, I'll, Other way. Nah, 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 what's up? You be giving hints. Am I giving? Is it the 80s, 90s, or it's or not 2000s? the 80s? It's the, it's it's go the opposite way. Not down, up. Not the 80s. Okay. All right. All right. Let me ask you this. Is it a show, you don't have to answer this, but is it a show that you recently tapped into? I mean, what? <laughs> is it The Office? What if it was? That's what I will say. <laughs> what if it was? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I, that, I'm looking for the role. Philip Seymour Hoffman said no to it. Guess what? They also considered Paul Giamatti and Bob Odenkirk None of them got it. What's the role? Is is it is it the office, Michael? Are you asking me or are you telling me? Are I'm you... telling you that. I'm telling you that. All right. This dude just said Philip Seymour Hoffman turned down the role of Michael Scott in the office. Could he possibly be right? Yeah! <laughs> we got home, baby. <laughs> Nate, you're three for five. You just tied Steve Smith Sr. with five questions left with the worst score ever, which is good. Nate, the reason I ask you about the office, uh, the workplace, you work around a lot of successful people, not just yourself, um, not just me, frankly, but all these people. What is the one defining trait that you see in the most successful people you're around? The ones that are the most successful they never turn their heart light off. They are always passionate about what they're doing. Mm. There are days when you work with somebody and you realize that they can care less. Um, but when you're around successful people, um, whether it's their career, how much money they're making, or just their status, they're always on. You know, working with Gail, every story from the very small, to the largest story that everybody is talking about in the world, she's locked in. If we have an author on the show, they give us a book. It doesn't matter if it's a few days before they come on. Gail's thumbing through it. Mm -hmm. And then she'll show up the day of, and she's like, so, in chapter four, mm -hmm. and I was like extremely fascinated um, 
by that. And then I started to think about all of the very successful people that I know. And that's it. I never meet somebody that's uber successful. And they're like, oh, well, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> no, nah, nah, I'll just show up. I'll do my thing. Cause sure. you know, it's, it's always the ones that love what they're doing every day. Not saying that you're always going to be good. Not saying that you're always going to, um, you know, land it. You know, I'm, I'm saying that you see it in somebody that they're passionate 24 seven. And those people I feel like will always have a job or at least a job waiting because at the very least, no matter how good somebody is at their job, somebody that's passionate is going to work their ass off. I know. And, and that's what successful people do. I agree. And in our industry, um, I've seen people who fake it and they can get by, but you can tell it's not lasting. And I look at the cream of the crop and whoever it may be, uh, James Brown, Joe Buck, whoever, Mike Tirico, like those guys work so hard and they're so committed and they're all so wealthy and so successful and they don't give a damn and they work their asses off. You can't fake it forever. Well, listen, Kyle, you're a prime example of that. And I, you know, I've, I've talked to you plenty of times over the years, you know, called you out at dinner, having a couple of drinks. I'm like, bro, the way you approach the show, it's like iron sharpening iron. Like it's, it's like playing with a talented wide receiver and then saying to myself, damn, I got to go hit the weight room. I got to go work on this release move because I don't have that one in my pocket. I need to learn how to run that post corner post. I got the post corner down, but that post corner post that Kyle's running, I need that because I see him getting open and being successful and scoring touchdowns. Like you've, you've had moments, it be the middle of the off season, teams are gone, <laughs> players on vacation. There is absolutely nothing to talk about. And you show up. Like you are hosting the Emmys, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, yo, that right there, you can't fake that. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't, you can't, and that's one of those things you can't create falsely either. So um, yeah, you're a prime example of that, bro. That's why you're successful, man. Thank you. The problem is, is that that other wide receiver who was allegedly learning from me went and signed a max contract and I'm still playing out my rookie deal. <laughs> but we'll deal with that some other time, Nate. Number six, this is my favorite question of the 10. I'm so excited to do this. All right. Question number six, the category is finish the lyric. So I play a song for you. You're gonna hear the lyricist, the vocalist doing his or her thing. It's going to stop on a dime. And when the vocals stop, you need to finish the line for the point. Okay. Got All it? Right. All right. All right. I I'm so excited for this. <laughs> You're gonna love this song. All right, here we go. Nate Burleson, finish the lyric. And whispering as I walk down the hall, I got home and told my mom how my day went. She said if they were laughing, you don't need them because they're not good friends. For the next six hours, I tried to explain to my mom that I was going to have to go through this about 200 more times. So to you other kids all across the land, there's no need to argue. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. I mean, it's, it's real. I mean, it's real. I mean, no matter who you are, <laughs> parents just don't understand. You yeah. Know? Real. Parents just don't understand. Hey. Oh. <laughs> Here's the situation. Right. Parents Kyle. go away. All right, what do you got? Kyle. What do you can, got? Can, go. I, just, can I get it? Can I just can I just get it one, one time? The, the, can I get the, the Will Smith on Family Guy? <laughs> hey, ho! Wrap your feet before you walk those floors. Your parents just wash those floors. Ha ha! Hey, hey! Make sure to take care of your mom and your dad. Ho ho! <laughs> That's the stuff we used to do in Good Morning Football commercials. <laughs> the Family Guy, Will Smith. Um, Nate, some of the questions I put down, I'm just like, I don't. I know Nate knows it. I just want to have fun with him and talk about parents just don't understand. Um, you're four for six. You've now passed Steve Smith. You will not have the worst score ever, and you're getting hot. Parents just don't understand. Nate, you have three children. Yeah. You have two sons and a daughter. Fact is, there's cards on the table. Those children uh, grow up in a wealthy family. They grow up with a famous set of parents. How do you handle that? The kids say they want for nothing and their parents are famous. Like, how does that make parenting hard? What do you do? It is very difficult. And it's um, a fine line that you have to walk. I remember uh, Nate being very young. Um, You're playing flag football for the first time, little Nate playing flag football. And he was say around eight or nine. And at this point, he's just a fast black kid, you know, and he's just running through every team. And I remember him facing another black kid. It was like the first time he saw, it was like the Spider-Man meme. He was like, oh, snap. It's like, <laughs> damn, that dude, he looked just like me and he's sure. fast. And the coach came over and he's like, hey, uh, Nate, can I talk to you? And I'm like, what's up? He's like, 
So uh, your son saying his knee hurt and I, he was warming up early. He's fine. I just think he might be a little shook because this team is really good. And I was like, what? He's like, it, it, and I kind of felt it. And I walked over to him. He's like, yeah, dad, my knee is hurting. You know, I just, and I'm like, Nate, what's going on? Like, are you, are you shook? Are you scared? Because you see another kid that looks like you that might be as talented as you, or maybe even more like what's going on. And at that moment, I realized like, he lives this privileged lifestyle. Of course, athletically, it makes sense in that scenario. Um, but also in life in general, he, he's never going to have to want for anything, at least right now. Um, he, he's always had enough money to buy the best sneakers and the new gaming system when it comes out. Um, he has what he needs. How do I instill that desire to fight and be tough in moments? Toughness, man. How do you do it? How do you do it? So at that point, I kind of earmarked it. Um, I said something to him. I talked to him, but he was really too young to digest it. I was like, come on, you can't quit. You got to be tough. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I remember my wife, like, he's too young for that conversation. You fast forward years later, he was a teenager um, in his early teens. He's playing in, in like deep jersey at a basketball tournament. He's playing up. And the other team, you know, in Jersey, kids be reclassing like crazy. Like <laughs> half of the team had beards and tattoos. One kid was smoking a cigarette on his way into the gym. <laughs> they, they was like the Harlem Globetrotters. And so my son, <laughs> exactly. So my son's like, as he's warming up, he's like peeking back. And I'm like, all right, here you go. He's more focused on the other team than he is on himself. Yeah. He gets in the game. He's kind of rattled. He has a turnover. And then he, he's quickly taken out. And he went to the back of the bench. And we, he was so comfortable being there that I can tell he just checked out. Yeah. So we get in the car I'm good. and my wife, she was like, um, I'm going to take, Mia and Nehemiah in my car, <clears throat> I'm going to let you drive with Nate. Because she already saw it all over my face. Daddy time. Let's do it. Roll up the sleeves. This was the moment that I wanted to talk to him about, but he was too young when he was playing flag football. And I said, look, man, you're going to be in a situation a couple of years from now in high school where every kid is older. It doesn't matter. And you're in Jersey, kids reclass. And if you go to college and you play sports, there's going to be kids that are in their 20s that are there. And every kid that's on a scholarship is there to take your position. And I said, it happens in the league too. And then I quickly went into non-sports related topics. And I said, look, forget about sports. Who knows if you're gonna make it to the league? If you get a job and you are working in a cubicle and your superior wants to tear you down and you're not ready to stand on your 10 toes and be accountable for your job and excel He's going to beat you into the ground so much you quit. If there is a guy that is hired to do the same job you do and he's hungrier than you are, then he's going to take your job. And I kept extrapolating it. I was like, look, if you are dating your girl in college and you are this kind of passive individual and there is a guy that is handsome, has confidence, he comes by and flirts with your girl or talks to her and makes her feel more comfortable in his arms than she is in yours, yeah. he's gone, fam. Yeah. And I remember talking to him and just taking this one moment saying, if you give up now, you will give up so many times in the future. This isn't about sports. This is about being a man. Mm -hmm. And that was the last time I ever had that conversation with him. Got and I, I, I remember that because at the time he's sitting there looking at me and it was almost like it clicked. Like he realized like, damn, like, because I think if I was just like sports, 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 and what if you don't get a scholarship? And what if you don't make the league? Okay, I can care less about that uh, stuff. This is about being a man. And um, and and that's the toughest part is knowing when to choose your pockets on how to be a dad, be his friend, and then challenge him when life isn't challenging itself. Oh, Nate, that's beautiful. Right. And it's I feel like I'm gonna remember that to tell my son. And Nate's kids are doing great. And Nate's kids are really, really good at sports because they want to be, not because it makes them. <laughs> but you may buy their jersey someday. Nate, we have four questions left. All right, four out of six. It. Question number seven is your category is food. All okay. right, food. Check this question out, Nate. The dish, egg foo young, egg foo young, mm -hmm. is commonly known as a Chinese what? Soup. He says soup. Is soup the correct answer? Oh. The egg foo young is commonly 
formerly known as a Chinese omelet. Uh, apparently, oh. there's an omelet when they put their spices in and stuff like that. I know you've done a lot of cooking. You've done the Rachel Ray thing. This is one of the mm -hmm. many uh, appendages you have. But I'm not asking you about food. I'm asking about Egg Foo Young because here's what I know for a fact. You get this all the time. I'm very flattered to get it. Anybody does. Someone comes to you. They slide in your DMs and Instagram and they say, Nate, I love your work. I'm such a fan of yours. I am a college freshman at such and such and such, and my dream is to talk about the NFL or to talk about CBS Mornings. What is your advice to me? What can I do? How do you answer those questions? Reps, 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 just like somebody told me when I first got to the NFL Network, get as many reps as you can. I started getting reps at the NFL Network back in 2003, mm -hmm. and every summer I would either fly myself out or they would fly me out. They wouldn't pay me. Um, oftentimes they wouldn't put me up in a hotel. And I would just sit behind the scenes. Sometimes they would throw me on. Sometimes they wouldn't. If I'm coming off a big year, they'd be like, yeah, man, let's get you on the show. If I got injured or I didn't have an impact on the field that year, right. they're like, hey, yeah, we'll get you on for one day. But, you know, you can just see it, what happens behind the hey, scenes. You're so, an NFL player. What, that's like, what if you're just a person and you're like, yeah. I didn't play in the league, but I got, I have some thoughts and I want to get in sports media. Like, I just don't know how to do it. I, one, I would say reps, reps in the sense of doing it on your own platform. Like, how creative are you? I, I tell individuals all the time, and I get these messages a lot, and I try to help every single person because yeah, yeah. I understand. They're like, look, Nate, you seem cool. You seem down to earth, and you're relatable. Even though you played in the league, there's some things I identify with. Um, what can I do? If you are creative, it's kind of like being an a athlete at a small school. The league will find you eventually if you do enough damage. So if you put in enough work, not about going viral in the in – the, the Takashi 6 9 way, but I'm talking about going viral in the creative way. Think about the most popular people that have been going viral over the last handful of years. These aren't athletes. Athletes already are viral. Why are we familiar with faces and people that didn't play sports? Because they just kept beating on their craft. And then one day, out of the thousand videos, that one just hit. And then when that hit, everybody was like, oh, wait a minute, they have a whole catalog of wow, this person is funny. They're creative. They can write. They can script. Oh, we should bring this person on, maybe not as a TV talent, but as a producer or a writer for a show. So I just say, be creative. For people that are sitting on their hands and saying, man, what can I do? I really know the game. And I'm, I'm, I'm funny around my people. I mean, at the barbershop, I'd be killing them. Okay, that's not enough, though. Like, put a camera up and work and work. It's just like anything else, man. You think you're good until you see yourself on film. And then you realize, Oh, man, I can be a lot better. And you know what comes with work and reps is growth and getting better. It's never been easy in human history, never been easier to produce content, to put things okay. on the Internet, to TikTok, a Twitter, an Instagram. That's your show. Hit that hard. Hit it over and over. And eventually yeah. you'll get noticed. Nate, Justin Bieber was singing songs on a street corner, right? Like, And they're like, wow, this kid's really good. It's, it's never been easier. Reps put it out there. Don't be afraid to make that first video and publish it on Instagram. Nate, you have yep. three questions left. This All is right. going to be a fun one. Number eight is name that theme. I'm going to play for you a television theme. If you don't know Nate, Nate like loves um, old 80s TV shows, 90s shows, when they would have like a five minute intro sequence and a song <laughs> and everything. All right. So Nate, I'm not saying it's one of those, but as you sit here at a four out of seven, Nate, I'm gonna play a TV theme, maybe 10, 15 seconds. Okay. What television show is this theme song from? Love, life's sweetest reward. The love, soon we'll be making another love. The love, Nate was crooning this thing right in the middle of it. Oh, you are so right, dude. <laughs> you knew the Love Boat theme. That's so old. Like, we were really young for that, man. I don't know why I was watching the Love Boat mash in Gilligan's <laughs> Island. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I, we'd watch I Love Lucy or like Black and White when we were kids. <laughs> exactly. It was a great show, though. It was a great show. Nate, we've worked together a lot of years, and we've danced around this a little bit. Oh, this I is see simple. what you did here. Oh, I, yeah. see, I see what you did here. Okay. Back in the day when you were a young player in the Minnesota Vikings, the biggest story in sports, maybe in the country, yeah. was this quote-unquote love boat story involving yeah. some Minnesota Vikings on a boat out on the lake. Now, listen, you've kind of danced around this story and told your little yeah. PG version, whatever. I get it. Nate, 
Tell the Love Boat story in all its Red Band trailer glory. What do you got? What happened? All right. So we were supposed to have a rookie dinner, right? And uh, a couple of vets came up with an idea of doing the dinner and then inviting, you know, friends from out of town and turn it into a party. Now, there was some advice from some people um, at the organization that he said, hey, just do it at like a ballroom at a hotel. People are safe there. And if you're an adult doing adult things, you can go up to a room and have your own space. Um, but guys are like, nah, we'll just do it on a boat. We'll make it different. You know, we're going to, you know, sanctify ourselves on the waters of Lake Minnetonka, like the Prince said in uh, right. the Pale. Uh, and uh, and so we uh, we set up these we, we set up these boats. Now, I say we because it was a team effort, but there's only a couple of guys that planned this whole thing. So it was like invite, you know, hey, guys, this weekend we're having the rookie dinner. It's going to be on the boat. It's going to be wild. We're going to have a good time. Uh, cool. I went out to dinner with a friend. One of my homeboys was in town um, and there were two boats. One boat, one boat takes off. It's like a big boat. Everybody went on it. Um, and I pull up and it's like it's like leaving. They're like, anybody want to rush and come? And I was just I was just coming off of an injury. So I had crutches. I'm like crutching. I'm like, I'm like, y'all go ahead, man. I'm good. I'm going to just crush my way on to the second boat. I get on the second boat and um, and we're sitting there and we take off and we're playing cards. There's ladies on each boat. You know, it's look at it like a party in Vegas. You know what I'm saying? Where you got music, you got you got dancing, you got girls that are dressed a little bit. Uh, what's the word? There you go. Um, and <laughs> and I remember getting a call from somebody who's on the other boat, and they're like, "Yo, it's it's getting out of hand out here." And I'm like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "Yo, so wait, like, he hits you up on the cell phone, like because you got a flip cell phone." phone. Okay, yeah. so boat one like calls you from a friend. A Zach Morris phone. Why are you holding the hand like this? <laughs> so you're on the 86 uh, Vikings. No. All right. So they call you from antenna. boat one. So, and so, say, yeah. So, um, so yeah, he's like, yo, it's getting out of hand. I'm like, what's he? He's like, yo, like, it's it's getting wild over here. This is turning into more, more of a club. And I'm like, yo, what do you mean? So my boat is pretty much chill. It's relaxed. You know what I'm saying? It's like a it's like a house party, like how house parties used to be where People would hang out. You see, might see some people making out, you know what I'm saying, going off into a dark corner. But it wasn't anything crazy. We ended up getting back. And I remember um, being at a, a library and I was uh, doing something for the kids on a Tuesday. Right. And I'm sitting there with the wife and the kids. And um, and then as as I'm leaving the library after giving out some award and, and, and gift and some scholarship to a kid who's has been an academic um, an all-star that, that year. Uh, the reporter's like, hey, Nada, what's going on? Uh, so, uh, you know, you uh, give it out to the kids in the community. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, they love the kids. I love the kids. Uh, you know, I'm just here trying to do my thing. You know, I'm doing my whole political thing. And then the next question, she was like, so we hear that you were on the boat. What's going on with the boat? Boat, 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 boat. And I was like, Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> right. My wife here, my kid, like, what's this talking about? I'm like, bro. I'm like, I'm like bro. She set you up. She did the rope and dope on you, dude. Bad. <laughs> I'm like, nah, nah, you're tripping. Like, I don't know anything about what you're talking about. Right. Then it comes to find out that there were reports that some servers on the other boat saw some things that they weren't expecting. And from there, it became this like blanket over everybody that was there. It doesn't matter if you didn't, if you, if you didn't get on the first boat, it doesn't matter if you sat down the whole time. It doesn't matter. I was standing on crutches the entire time. So people ask me this question, like, were you dancing? Were you, were you hanging out? Were you, were you, were you hanging out with girls? And how can I dance? I'm coming off of a knee injury. Um, so the unfortunate thing, there were a bunch of guys that went to have a good time and ended up being roped in on allegations. Some of them exaggerated, um, which there were supposed to be all these charges. And if you look at the actual charges, um, none of them actually stuck because, uh, you know, it's kind of like the telephone game. The server says she saw this. She tells the boyfriend. The boyfriend tells the pastor. The pastor tells somebody else. They tell the new. Before you know it, they're like purple monkey dishwasher. And they're like, nah, that's not what I said in the very beginning. So. Um, so yeah, so that, that was, that was how it happened, man. It was, it was crazy because, uh, we had like an emergency meeting and I respect, uh, Mike Tice for this. 
and I don't think I've ever like really shared this part. Um, Your head Mike coach. Tice, the head coach, Mike Tice, had an emergency meeting after hearing about it. He's like, look, we heard about what was going on. Um, I hear that, you know, majority of you guys, you weren't doing anything. And for some of you guys, you were single, so you can do whatever you want. But if you feel like you might have done something that's inappropriate, you know, you may want to protect yourself. Um, and this was like a real moment to me. I was like, wow, like this went from football to guys having to possibly get lawyers. Yeah. Um, um, luckily, you know, I think it, majority of the things that were said were exaggerated, um, but it definitely taught me a lesson. You know, don't plan parties if if you don't know how the turnout is going to be and who's going to be working them. Quickly, if you didn't have the knee injury, if you got you pulled up five minutes earlier and you had made the first boat, do you think your career or your life would have been any different? No, but what happened was there were guys that were guilty by association. Yeah, and right. another thing was there were there were guys who actually weren't on the boat that were pointed out by people who were there. Oh so God. servers would say, oh, this guy was there. And he was like, bro, I was at home with my family. And, and he was. So I think there were a bunch of guys that were on other boat simply drinking, eating, relaxing, mm -hmm. playing cards. And they because they were there, they were easily pointed out. So maybe, maybe if I was on another boat, somebody would have said, I seen him on there. But one yeah. thing's for sure, they couldn't say they saw me doing anything because I wasn't. I know. That's not how you roll. You never have. You got a beautiful family. You and Atoya go all the way back to college. Nate, you're five for eight. You passed Bill Simmons. Yeah. You are now in a position to finish as good as seven. Let's finish this up. Question number nine. Nate, you get to choose your category in this one. You can choose. Do you want it, the category to be Europe or Kansas? Which one? Let's go with Kansas. I'm going to go Kansas. All right. Yeah. A Kansas State product in the NFL by the name of Jordy Nelson. During Jordy Nelson's time with the Packers, what was his nickname? Oh. His nickname was, um, I should know this. Uh, has to be some. Jordy Nelson, number 87 for the Packers out of Kansas State. Great player, big deep threat. What was his nickname? I, um, I, I, I want to say like Air Jordan, but that's too simple. So I'll, I'll say, like, damn it. Was it was it White Lightning? No, it wasn't. I know it wasn't. What was it? What's your answer? I'm going to go with White Lightning. Jordy Nelson's nickname while with the Packers was White Lightning, Nate. <laughs> you got that's it. it. Yeah. That's it. Oh, my. Yeah, that's it. And when he left, and I remember Rodgers would hashtag White Lightning, and there's all these fans had White Lightning t-shirts. Dude. That and the hard to kill were two of your toe drag swag catches on the sideline where everyone's going incomplete. And you go, no, I caught it. You can review it. I got it. Oh, my God. You know, you know why? Um, you know, some of these things are just popping up, you know, just because of they're, they're deep and buried away. I am a huge fan of Jordy Nelson. Yeah. Listen, you know, I am, bro. We, we see race, which is why we're such yeah, close man. friends. Um, and, and we address it. The one thing I've always talked about, especially when I play. I just felt like Jordy Nelson wasn't getting a lot of love. I don't know if it was him being in Green Bay. I don't know if it was him being a white receiver. But I said the same thing about Wes Welker when he was going on for them few, sure. few years. So that's why I remember that, because I was like, y'all need to be paying attention to White Lightning. I remember one year he led, he led the league in, in touchdowns, and it was everybody acted like it was a normal thing. I believe it was 14. No, it was incredible. And they were all deep bombs, too. Mate, you're at six out of nine. You just passed right. Aaron Andrews, who got a five. This is The reason I brought this up is not even a football thing. The best times that you and I have ever had working together in five years were talking about race and joking yeah. about it. When I say talking about race, I don't mean race relations. I mean like dumb jokes about you're a black guy and I'm a white guy. And it is always so much fun that we've had. Can you still do that, Nate? Like you have high profile jobs now. It, the, the times have changed. You're two co-hosts uh, on yeah. CBS Mornings. Could you make a joke to one who is white and say, you know, uh, oh, well, leave the dancing to Gail and me. Like, would you, could you do that? Would you do that? Would you get in trouble? Because on Good Morning Football, we'd say stuff like that constantly. What's the state of that? You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to steal that one. That, that's simple enough. <laughs> well, that's a good starting point. It's the stupidest point. thing, but you know what I mean? Like, that's yeah, how we no, used to talk no, to each other. Yeah, no, um, Tony DeCopo, we are the same age. So we graduated um, the same year in high school. And we had um, we had uh, DJ D-Nice on the show. And he was DJing. And Tony got up there and he's like, look, I don't dance. I can't dance. Okay. Um, and we did the whole like 
hitch thing. Like, this is your pocket. Stay right here. Yes. Okay. Um, and he laughed about it. People in the studio laughed about it. And I told him, you know, right out the gate, I said, look, I'll crack an occasional joke. But just so you guys know, I'm not sensitive. I, I come from a place where um, if you can make fun of somebody that you work with and they're OK with it, um, the workplace will be a, a lot funner. And he was like, me, too. And at that point, Gail was like, oh, yeah, me, too. So let's all crack jokes. And we kind of just took down the, the barriers right there. That's one. That's only one part of it. The, the next layer is the viewer. CBS Morning News. This is different. So, you know, a, we, I may crack a joke and Tony's cool with it or he may crack a joke on me. And then there is a demographic of people that are watching like, oh, what's up with the racist black dude or what's yeah. up with the racist white guy? Like, so um, what we have to do is do it and do it fearlessly. And, that, and that's what we have done. There's times where we have we have told the line and we have giggled our butts off. And I think even when people may think that there's this discomfort between us, when we break all that up on air and, and kind of pull back the curtain, it's OK. You know, I mean, text messages and, and not text messages, uh, messages I've had online, whether it's DMs or, or Twitter messages. And people are like, yo, what's up with the jokes? Like, are you really going to say that to Kyle? Or is Kyle really going to say that to you? What's up with Peter? He's kind of coming at you crazy. Why would Kate say that to you? And I'm like, nah, we're good. Like, we're good. And until you see me upset, you're not allowed to be upset for me. And, and I think that's where I stand. And, and it's going to be the same thing on CBS Mornings. And I'm not afraid to talk about those things either. If somebody feels a certain type of way about something I said, I'll apologize. But if somebody wants to be upset for me, I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't be. That's great. Nate and I once, um, we were doing a highlight on Good Morning Football, and we had realized that it's one of those dumb food days. It's National Chalk Chip Cookie Day or whatever. And it was National White Chocolate Day. And I said, <laughs> Nate, let's do this up. I'm going to do it. And for my part of the highlight, I'm just going to include all these things that white people like. And then you're like, all right, well, I'll include all things black people like. And we just started going. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> play some Springsteen and light a scented candle and do some yoga. We got the Packers. And then you're off and running. And it was like, that was some of the most fun we've ever had. We were giggling, oh, dude. No doubt about it, man. <laughs> we were talking about, and look at the, uh, look at the, the pile break up faster than black people watching magic or something like that. You know, <laughs> Like the, right. those, those um, are jokes, man. Nate, you got really hot as usual. The talent rises to the top. And your last question, you're six out of nine. You're the best. You're my brother. The question number 10 is always an essay question in which I will present you with a take that you have had and you have the floor, whatever, as long as you want to defend that take. And if I'm convinced, I give you the point. If not, I don't. Nate, uh, we love television and movies, obviously. There's a lot of um, really attractive women that we loved when we were kids and had crushes on. Uh, you had a crush, like your number one television crush was on the woman in this clip, roll it. <laughs> How can I repay you? Well, honey, you can do for mommy that thing that great big Al does best uh, for his itty bitty uh, Y. <laughs> Come on, honey, do it. Take out the garbage. <laughs> Nate, that's Peg Bundy, married with children. She does it for you. I think she's she's always has and still does. You have the floor to tell us and all the 10 questions viewers and listeners why Peg Bundy is of all characters gets you going. Go ahead. Well, listen, man, before I was able to see Holly Berry in the 90s or Hillary and Ashley Banks on The Fresh Prince, you know, before I was able to, to fall in love with J-Lo as, as she took <laughs> off after Lemon Color, for some reason, inexplicably, I was watching Married with Children. I probably shouldn't have been watching, but Fox was on fire at that time. Oh, talk about it. They were on fire. And now, so many years later, being a married man with children, you kind of idea you you identify with Al because occasionally, you, you know, your wife embodies that that like you might be telling me something, but I'm not listening. Or you're like, "Honey, what's up?" Like. I, I, it's a long day. Can I get like a foot rub or like, can I get like something to eat? And she's like, I got a life too. That was Peg. All right, now let's just talk about the fact that she was just different at the big old, big old, big old hair. Um, I just, you know, it was a, 
it, there was these like really contrasting um, views of women. And I saw uh, Claire Huxtable, smart black woman, incredibly beautiful, sure. you know, the, it, it's doctor. And then you had, uh, and then you had Peg Bundy, who was just like the opposite in every way. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, yo, who knows what's going to happen when I get older? I may meet a Peg Bundy. At least I now have a blueprint for how to deal with her. And Al Bundy was that. That is such a great answer. And it's such a great character. And I love it. And it amuses me. And you're sitting there looking at Peg. One thing now as a husband and a father, oh, Peg Bundy. Dude, as a younger man, all you got to do is take your eyes to the right of the screen and go to Kelly Bundy. I can't give you the point, Nate. I'm sorry. You got so many points. You do not have that one. Six out of ten. Nate, you have finished the ten questions. It is over. It is everything I knew you were capable of. Food, booze, sitcoms, football. How do you feel? I feel great, man. That was fun. So uh, hopefully, you know, I'll be the first ever contestant to repeat, but let me, let me, let me, you know, step my game up. I plan to win a couple of Emmys this year. So here's the deal. If I win another Emmy, Mm -hmm. let me come on and redeem myself. We might as well book it now, Nate. It'll be a letdown if you only win one this year. Six out of 10, you tied with Aaron Rodgers. Um, The last bit of business we have here, Nate, every single contestant who comes on 10 questions finishes with a call out. A call out being, think of one person, a public figure, maybe you know them, maybe you don't, doesn't matter. And you look into the camera and challenge them to come into 10 questions and beat your six out of 10 score, whoever you like, Nate. Okay, see, I I was thinking about this. I was going to reach for the stars, but I I want somebody that, you know, we can actually land on um, and somebody that will be really fun at this. Okay. So for me, um, I'm going to challenge to come on 10 questions and beat my score of six out of 10. Alfonso Ribeiro. <laughs> Talk to him. Known as Carlton on the Fresh Prince, but I don't want to go with the Carlton route because he hears that of all course. the time. But he is a cool dude. I talked to him a few times working for Extra. He has a great personality, a wealth of knowledge. He has a ton of stories and he'll be fun. He will be fun. So I feel like, Alfonso, what's up? I'm calling you out right now. I got a six out of 10. Can you do this? And no, we will not ask you to do the dance. No. All right. No, we would just ask you the questions and see if you could beat my six out of 10, which I bet you can't. It's perfectly done. We will not ask you to do the dance, but we're going to, we got lots of questions about Uncle Phil. Trust me, we got tons about that. Um, Nate, you're the best. We go back years. I hope to know you for the rest of my life. Someday we're going to work together, my friend. You and I will be reunited. It'll be like in Predator with Schwarzenegger and Carl Weathers, and we'll do we'll do the handshake. <laughs> that is all we got. That is Nate Burleson, a 6 out of 10. Thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. Click like, subscribe, all that nonsense. Nate, I love you. We'll see you next time on 10 Questions. You too, man. This episode of 10 Questions was produced by Arjuna Ramgopal, Steve Allman, Richie Bozek, and Isaiah Blakely.